oral questions by members. Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Another day, another damning housing report for British Columbians. This time it's the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation Housing Market Outlook. And it spells more bad news for this Premier, but depressingly, really bad news for young families desperate to own a home. Now, despite housing being the NDP government's signature promise in 2017 when they got elected, housing affordability, their signature promise, we find that the announcements and re-announcements and empty rhetoric have resulted in millennials suffering the worst housing outcomes in the country. This report confirms that under the Premier's watch for two years as Housing Minister and now as Premier, BC is not only the worst in the country, but things are about to get a whole lot worse. Through to the end of 2025, the severe lack of housing affordability will continue to worsen, housing starts will plummet, and vacancy rates are forecast to bottom right out, rock bottom. And what the public is really starting to understand, Mr. Speaker, is that there is this huge chasm, once again, between what this NDP government promises and the results that we actually get. So my question to the Premier, does the Premier not realize that empty announcements and rhetoric and re-announcements are utterly meaningless for young families who under the NDP find their dream of owning a home to be devastatingly shattered by the reality of what's actually happening? Minister of Housing. Thank you so much, Honourable Speaker. I really appreciate the question from the member. And, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, the, the issues we hear from people in our communities is, I think, similar. Uh, young people want to find opportunities to uh, raise their families here in British Columbia, raise their families in, in communities perhaps that they grew up in, and, uh, and seniors want to make sure that their kids and their grandkids can be close to them. That's why the Homes for People strategy that we launched has so many initiatives to help support that. Building on top of the success that we've already had building housing in British Columbia. We know we're decades behind. We know there's decades of underinvestment in this province when it comes to affordable housing. That's how we got here. But we know we have to continue not only invest, we can't come into a situation where we say, uh, well, let's do nothing. Let's just step out of the way. We've been there. We've seen that formula. It doesn't work, Honorable Speaker. So that's why the strategy we have in front of us uh, lays out things like small-scale multi-units so that when an expensive home gets torn down, there's more options on that site for more types of housing to be built, allowing the private sector to build some of that important housing. I certainly hope the member across the way and members across the way uh, support our initiatives as we go forward. Certainly the early indications uh, is that they don't. Um, but these types of initiatives are going to be vitally important to ensure we have the affordable housing for people across the province. Leader of the Official Opposition, Supplemental. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the Minister uh, shouldn't be surprised that we're hardly going to support the kind of efforts that have got us the highest housing prices in North America and the highest rents in the entire country. This devastatingly bleak report not only exposes the Premier's many failures as a housing minister, but also drives home how things are going to continue to get a lot worse for millennials under his watch. And I quote directly from the report, quote, millennials are now well into their 30s. Many will not be able to afford to buy and large swaths of aging millennials will delay the move to home ownership." End of quote. So adding insult to injury, this delayed home ownership will put more pressure on rents, forcing Vancouver renters to face increases of over $600 per month for a two-bedroom apartment by 2025. And that's on top of the over $400 a month increases they've already faced under this NDP government since 2017. So let's, let's think about this for a second. Since they formed government in 2017, that means over $1,000 more a month in rent. It's no wonder that we now have people leaving for Alberta at the greatest rate we've seen since the last time they were in government in the 1990s. So my question to the Premier, how can anyone possibly trust this Premier and this government when he is causing the worst, worst housing results, not just in Canada, but indeed in North America? Minister of Housing. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. And I have a report here as well that says 
Canada's most expensive cities continue to rise significantly. Those on the lower end of the spectrum have seen rents trend lower, but the, the most expensive cities uh, in the province are BC. This is October 2016, when they were on the side of the House, Mr. Speaker. British Columbia uh, has been one of the most desirable places for people to live. I think the member may uh, also know um, that we have been seeing record numbers of people come to British Columbia. Historic numbers, in fact, never seen in this province in history. And so we welcome people. We want them here, but we want them to be successful when they arrive. That's why the Homes for People strategy advances important initiatives, like small-scale multi-units as one example of that, Honourable Speaker, where we get to see when an expensive home comes down, more options be built so that young people get an opportunity to actually buy into the market, Honourable Speaker. This builds on the work we've done, the historic amount of units that we've seen come online. We know there's a lot more work to do Honourable Speaker, and that's why I hope that all members in this House support the Homes for People strategy, overwhelmingly popular amongst the development community, the private sector, not-for-profit communities, uh, advocates, uh, the housing advocates, all of them are saying this strategy hits the mark, and I certainly hope that they'll support it. Member for West Vancouver, Capilano. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, well, with respect to the minister, it is under this government's watch and under this NDP government that rents have gone up uh, $600 more um, by the end of 2025 and, and 400 since this government came in. So it's this government that they need to look, them, look in a mirror and take responsibility for this. Now, CMHC is also saying that the Premier's failures on housing are set to create disastrous bottlenecks in Vancouver's housing market. And I will quote, supply growth hasn't kept pace with demand. Average two-bedroom rents are set to increase significantly over the forecast horizon, end quote. Things are getting worse, Mr. Speaker. They are not getting better. Uh, homes for people, we hear the minister talk about homes for people. Well, what people are those homes for? In Surrey, renters like Linda de Gonzalez, a 70-year-old senior on a fixed income, she now faces a 42% increase in her rent due to the broken and unaffordable rental market under this premier. So, Mr. Speaker, why are people having to pay higher and higher rents under this premier when he promised them results? Here, here. Minister of Housing. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. And, uh, you know, I appreciate the members raising this question. I think it's an important topic. But it's important to acknowledge that we're two decades behind when it comes to investment housing. I mean, you know, I appreciate them saying that there's not enough housing now, but when they were on this side of the house, they weren't making the investments in housing that's required to ensure we can build affordable housing, Honourable Speaker. They just simply won't. Right now, we have more homes under construction than any point in the last 60 years. We know we're going to need to continue to see housing investments be made in this province. We know we're going to need not-for-profits to build more housing, uh, make sure they can address uh, uh, the type of housing the private sector is not able to do. But we also need to enable the private sector to build homes faster. And that's why, Honourable Speaker, the small-scale multi-unit is a prime example. A home comes down. We want to ensure that if if the market wants a single-family home, if people can afford it, they'll continue to build it. But if, if they can't, we want to make sure that there's options available for young families to actually purchase, Honourable Speaker. That's what the goal of the plan is to be about. And it builds on the work we've already done. We've already brought thousands of units back online. The speculation tax, for example, brought 20,000 units back online, Honourable Speaker. <laughs> Single policy, which brought thousands, 20,000 units back on the market, Honourable Speaker, and, and the opposition opposed it. They were said it's unfair for a person who owns multiple homes uh, to have to pay an additional tax, Honourable Speaker. We're making different choices over here, Honourable Speaker. We're going to con continue to invest in housing, work with the private sector, work with our partners to build the affordable housing in this province. Member for West Vancouver, Capilano, supplemental. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, this minister can say what he wants and use all the rhetoric that he wants, but it is not helping British Columbians and it's not helping millennials get into housing. Yeah, yeah. And BC seniors receive the lowest support in the entire country while grappling with an affordability crisis that continues to get worse. 
Under this Premier, the number of vulnerable seniors waiting for subsidized seniors' housing has shockingly surged by 72 per cent, with an average wait time, Mr. Speaker, of three years. So the Premier has failed seniors and left thousands in desperate need. This is what Linda said when she was told about the 42 per cent increase. Quote, I nearly fainted. I just sat on the floor and cried, unquote. So, Mr. Speaker, how does this Premier justify his complete failure to provide adequate, affordable housing for seniors in British Columbia? Minister of Housing. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. We have thousands of units being built across this province for young families, for seniors. Uh, and, you know, t to, the, to the folks who uh, are struggling, we know the struggle is real. That's why the investments we're making are uh, to the significant numbers that, that uh, the public is seeing. Honourable Speaker, imagine where those individuals would be if uh, we hadn't changed the amount that chart can be increased on rent. We have now a 2 per cent cap. And the BC uh, United Party, or Liberal Party, whatever they're calling themselves, had a 2 per cent plus CPI, Honourable Speaker. Imagine where those families would be if we hadn't made those changes, Honourable Speaker. We have a lot more work to do. We're going to continue to do that work, Honourable Speaker. Leader of the Third Party. Oh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. Uh, We've heard a lot of concerns about uh, public safety being raised in this legislature. We've heard about mental health care. We've heard about housing needs. But we rarely hear about the people who own and operate small businesses. Small businesses are the backbones of all of our communities. These businesses play such an essential role in our towns, in our communities, our economy. But they operate on very small profit margins and tend to have to go month to month. Challenges are spilling over onto their bottom lines and doorsteps, whether it's repairing shattered glass or removing graffiti or attracting customers, employees, small businesses are truly struggling. They're struggling to respond and they're struggling to be heard. Through you, Honourable Speaker, to the Minister of Jobs, Economic Development and Innovation, is the Minister willing to work with small business groups to work out the details of a fund that would help small businesses with the reactionary costs that they're having to deal with right now? Minister of Jobs. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Thank you to the Leader of the Opposition for the question on this very important topic. I absolutely agree that small businesses are so integral to our communities. Not only are they 98% of all businesses, but they contribute so significantly to our economy and to the communities that they're based in. And we know that small businesses are facing a number of significant headwinds. Global inflation, the cost of borrowing, and essentially the, what we can refer to as a, um, a hangover from the pandemic in many ways. And some small businesses continue to struggle. And I've been taking the opportunity to meet with small businesses, to hear their concerns, and we're looking at opportunities to support small businesses going forward. So in short, an answer to the member's question, yes. Leader of Third Party Supplemental. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. It's, it's nice when there is a topic that really unites all of us. I think everybody in this House agrees that we care about small businesses. We want to see them succeed. I really appreciate the Minister's response. Uh, and so the, there are local businesses, local business associations, chambers of commerce that have been really working towards solutions that would help small businesses stay viable in this very challenging economy that the minister just described. And they want to be a partner in putting the solutions forward for those challenges. So my question again for you, Honourable Speakers, the Minister of Jobs, Economic Development and Innovation, can the Minister commit to sitting down with these groups, these small business advocate groups, by the end of the legislative session to begin the work on the solutions? Minister of Jobs, Economic Development. Thank you very much, uh, Honourable Speaker, and thank you again to the member for the question. Um, I have been taking meetings with many of these organizations. I'm happy to take more, of course, but I've met with people across the province, representatives of small businesses, and many, many small businesses themselves. Um, we've held roundtables throughout the province, including uh, recent trips to Kamloops, to Quesnel, to Hundred Mile House, 
uh, Williams Lake, Prince George. We've met with folks on the island. We've met with folks in Vancouver. Uh, it's very, very important to me that I'm listening to small businesses, and we're certainly doing that work, Mr. Speaker. House Leader of Future Opposition. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Well, first off, uh, I think it's, it's fantastic to hear uh, the Green Party uh, stand in the House here today and express support for uh, flowing some supports to uh, hard-hit small businesses uh, that have been hit with vandalism. Um, I can do uh, suggest one thing better, though, than, than more meetings and, and engagement would be to actually call the bill that this side of the House has put on the order paper. And with, uh, So there's there's multi-party support. The two parties on this side. The only party that's missing is uh, is the government. So let's call the bill and actually get some support flowing for small business. Here, here. Here, here. Uh, but Mr. Speaker, on a, on a different topic. A week ago, uh, we raised concerns uh, from chaotic uh, or about a chaotic evacuation of Ridgeview Place in Langford, uh, where nearly 200 people were displaced uh, from their building. Uh, but despite the assurances and announcements from this government. These residents uh, have received little in the way of answers or assistance uh, from this government. Yesterday, Linda and Robert Taylor, an elderly couple and their son uh, who has uh, Down syndrome, uh, they had to leave their temporary hotel by 11 o'clock in the morning. And they left with absolutely nowhere to go. The overwhelming stress of the situation actually caused Linda to collapse and she was subsequently rushed to the hospital. Now, people need immediate assistance, uh, and they're simply not getting it from the Minister or from BC Housing. Frankly, uh, it's a disgrace that community organizers are having to resort to GoFundMe in an effort to aid residents who have been displaced. So my question to the Premier is this. When is the Premier going to offer more than empty words and actually step up and do something to help these displaced residents? Yeah, yeah. Minister of Housing. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker, and thanks to the member for the question. And certainly, uh, this is an awful situation. Uh, we don't, we would not want this on anyone. Uh, and, I, and it's a, you know, my heart goes out to these individuals, these families. Uh, I can share with the member that we um, uh, met with the mayor multiple times, met with the staff multiple times uh, to identify ways we can support them. Um, the member may know we provided uh, up to five days of hotel and all of the supports that individuals need uh, to support them. Uh, the Ministry for Emergency Management uh, has also funded a navigator for individuals to go to, to get supports, to get uh, access to housing. Uh, and certainly if the member has uh, that individual's name, uh, the navigator will be able to help find them the supports that they need, Honourable Speaker. Again, an awful situation. I've been in touch with the mayor multiple times to find ways that we can find uh, support these individuals. We've also contacted uh, the Insurance uh, Bureau of, of uh, Canada to find out about what supports these individuals have when it comes to insurance relief uh, because uh, of the situation that they're in. House Leader of Official Opposition, Supplemental. Uh, Mr. Speaker, if there was ever uh, an example of empty and hollow words that are going to land like a thud uh, exactly. with, with people, it would be what the Minister just said. Exactly. These are people that there is no support. They, 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 they have been, uh, in, in many cases, have been kicked out of the, of the hotel, which was a, a, a very, very temporary uh, solution, only intended to, to support them for a day or two. And many of them have absolutely nowhere to go. And it's wonderful to hear that, uh, that the minister has, uh, has met with, or officials from the ministry have met with the mayor and, and, and local officials. Uh, maybe maybe you should, the minister should meet with the residents and actually uh, get this problem solved. No more meetings, no more words, no more uh, hollow announcements. Just solve it. The government's got to do better. Uh, we're, we're hearing story after story of people who feel absolutely abandoned. They feel that this government is failing them uh, in this dire situation. Langford resident uh, Lisa Foxell says, and I quote, we're talking about people's lives. One person spoke about how his mental health is now affected. It took everything for him to get up and speak. He was in tears and his partner was there having a nervous breakdown. People just can't handle it and there's nobody there helping them, end quote. Again, people deserve more than just nice but hollow words.
from this government. They urgently require direct contact and immediate support. So again, what is the Premier going to do today to give these displaced Langford residents the immediate and long-term support that they so desperately need and deserve? Absolutely. Minister of Housing. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. And, uh, Certainly a challenging situation for all these families, for everyone involved. Uh, we've, again, been uh, working. Uh, Langford is the lead on this. This was uh, um, uh, understood, well understood, that Langford was leading the situation, but we were there to support them. We have been supporting them. We have a, uh, a dedicated person that is there to help them navigate any challenges uh, to find housing. Uh, but the member knows we, we are in a housing crisis. We are trying to find housing solutions as best we can. Uh, and I should remind the member that uh, we as a province step in, uh, BC Housing steps in, uh, to help communities whenever these issues arise. Uh, the member for Skeena will tell you, tell the members of this House, there was an issue in his community where people were displaced. BC Housing, uh, our ministry, worked around the clock to find solution in the short term, medium term, and now long term. And this is happens in community after community, Honourable Speaker. It's not an easy situation. Nobody wants to be in this type of situation, but we have supports on the ground to help people navigate the system. But we, can, we fully acknowledge that this will be a challenging time for many individuals and families. Member for Prince George Wellmount. Well, only the minister would think that providing supports results in an elderly couple with absolutely nowhere to go. Nowhere to go. Did the minister hear those words? And that's not the only story, one after another. And it's not just CMHC. Now the BC Medical Journal has provided further confirmation of the utter failures of BC Housing and the Premier's approach as Housing Minister. The Premier placed people with severe mental health and addictions all together in the same BC housing building, only to abandon them without any support. The research conclusively finds, and I quote, health needs are not being sufficiently addressed within supportive housing sites, end quote. Health needs are not being sufficiently met. The BC, journal, the BC Medical Journal. So when is the Premier going to listen to anyone, CMHC, the BC Medical Journal, and actually find help for people facing mental health and addictions challenges in British Columbia? This government is simply failing them, and it is time they did better. Minister of Housing. Honourable Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Um, I'm sure the member uh, read the entire report and knows that in the report they highlighted that uh, the study was done uh, during the height of the pandemic, where there were real challenges uh, finding people that were able to go into many of these sites to provide supports. Uh, we were dealing with a global pandemic, uh, individuals, staff, uh, we're, we were dealing with challenges with people getting COVID. We were dealing with people uh, not reporting to work. Um, and so it was a challenging time, and everyone acknowledges that. Now, uh, the member knows as well, I'm sure, that uh, the person who did the interviews uh, on this topic, uh, in particular around in Kelowna, also acknowledged that there are positive things happening now for mental health supports for individuals. Uh, since then, uh, Interior Health has actually increased the amount of supports for individuals that are in housing. Uh, that's a positive step, and we're going to continue to do a lot more because we know coming out of the pandemic, the need has grown, Oral Speaker. But the member, uh, uh, you know, I have to... Um, uh, push back on the members' assertion that uh, people are all being moved into one site. I think the members should remember that when there was an encampment in Victoria here, the former Minister of Housing on the other side moved all those individuals into one site. And often they stand in this house and criticize us about Pandora, but don't acknowledge the fact that that was a decision made by their government. The contracts were signed by their government, and we're dealing with some of the challenges because of that structure that was built at the time. We've learned a lot from them. Now the work we do with uh, not-for-profit providers is identifying the right needs for individuals. Please continue. Identifying the right needs for individuals and making sure that people that go into supportive housing, that there's a mix. Some that have more needs, some that have less, so that's more manageable for the staff, so we can ensure that they're successful. 
Member for Prince George Wilmore, supplemental. Two terms, six years, and it's always somebody or something else. The results speak for themselves. And let's look at what that report said. A staggering 72% of respondents reported unmet health needs. That's on this Premier's shoulders. The most shocking revelation is that numerous tenants developed substance use addictions after moving into the so-called supportive housing due to the close proximity to other use users and open substance use. <coughs> This is what one study participant reported, and I quote, in all honesty, I never smoked meth before I moved in here. What's the saying? If you sit in the barber shop long enough, eventually you're gonna get a haircut, end quote. That is on the shoulders of this premier. The minister can get up and wax eloquently all he wants. The fact of the matter is, the Premier needs to stop warehousing people in British Columbia and provide the supports he brags about every single day. Minister of Housing. Honourable Speaker, I, I have to remind the member, this is not warehousing. These are individuals. These are people's loved ones. yell at me from across the way all she wants, but these are human beings we're talking about. These are not units. These are not... Oh. Members, 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 members will listen to the chair. Please. Honourable Speaker, Minister will continue. you know, I think the reason why they use the terminology warehouse is because Perhaps they don't see these individuals for what they are, Shame Honourable Speaker. On Shame on this. Honourable Speaker, the Please. The, it's okay. The, the hand-picked president on. of the BC United Party, Honourable Speaker, take your time. Take your time. Minister. Perhaps, Honourable Speaker, the reason why they talk about it the way they do is because in the comments from the hand-picked Liberal the BC United President, he said we should focus on the 60% and essentially not bother with some of the demographics that will not, not likely absolutely never support us, like homeless people or those that are dependent on social supports. Perhaps, Honourable Speaker, those types of comments are reflected on why they use the terms that they use. Member for Cambridge North Thompson. <laughs> Member for Cambridge North Thompson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Report after report comes forward. This government dismisses the reports. These are people's words of how they're being treated under this government's watch that's had six years and it's failing miserably. Be it on rent levels, be it on home purchasing, be it on the warehousing of people without proper supports that they should have to help treat their serious mental health challenges. Without the supports, that is all it is, Mr. Speaker, and the government cannot like that term all they want, but that's the reality of what they've created. And now, and now we have another report, another report that this government has had for two months now. Now, I can appreciate... Just a second, member. When the minister was answering, this side was shouting and yelling at them. Now the other side is doing it. Please, both sides, stay calm. Minister, member will continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, this government has been in possession of the forensic audit for two months now. And I can appreciate that perhaps the Solicitor General was hogging the Sharpie as he was blacking out the Surrey Police Report. <laughs> but one would think that housing ministers had enough time to go to town on that report to at least release 20% of it, like the <laughs> Solicitor General did. It was over a month ago now, this minister was on Simi Sarah and said, I quote, I'm hoping that within a month we're able to get this out. Well, Mr. Speaker, the housing minister successfully dodged releasing this report 
in, while his budget estimates would have been open, so he could have actually had to answer some questions in this chamber at length on this. Convenient, Convenient timing for that. We don't have a long weekend for a little while coming up, so it won't be released till then, probably. But this Premier has his estimates coming up next week, Mr. Speaker, and he was the Housing Minister in the time frame that this forensic audit is dealing with. Can the Premier commit today to release the forensic audit of BC Housing before his estimates start so the public of British Columbia can have a proper airing and proper questioning of the forensic audit of BC Housing by the person who was the Minister at the time? Yeah. Okay, now let's listen to the answer. Minister. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I, again, we will not take lectures from a party that ripped out entire pages of ICBC reports to hide them from the public. Honourable Speaker, I've made it clear that I believe it's in the public interest for this report to be made public as much as legally possible. We, right now, are, we have informed... Shh, shh, shh. Mem members, members, members. Members, please. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I notified the House that uh, I, I met with the Privacy Commissioner. I shared with the Privacy Commissioner our plan to inform certain entities that are named in the report, our, our time frame of how we're proceeding to engage with them uh, and how we will release the report. Uh, Honourable Speaker, the, those engagements are happening and uh, the members will have that report very soon. The balance of question period.